It is the third chapter of Luke, verses 15 to 22. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus will come and baptize in the Holy Spirit. Yikes. Presbyterians are notoriously bad at the Holy Spirit. I just want to make that confession on a part of my church. And furthermore, I am no exception to that rule. My, my credentials on the, the Father and the Son are just a, a good deal better than those on the Holy Spirit. As you'll see, as I just spent the last four or five weeks talking about one particular aspect of the second person of the Trinity, and now I'm going to struggle to fill a whole Sunday with the third. To illustrate this, Bart, Karl Bart, who is perhaps the favorite theologian of Presbyterianism USA, he was a, a theologian during World War II, we love him because he hated Nazis really good, and he was very smart, he wrote 14 volumes, over 6 million words, it fills up an entire bookshelf, this book is called Church Dogmatics, it doesn't fit into one book of course, 14 books, um, he didn't make it to the Holy Spirit. He had a, an additional volume planned, but he died first. That's very typical of us. In, in perhaps a, uh, a, a, a more recent example, in my intro to theology class, we went through the Apostles' Creed every week of the 12 weeks of the semester. We had one week on each line of the Apostles' Creed, so the Holy Spirit was planned for the last week, but we ran behind schedule. And we missed the Holy Spirit. I think that's true also in a lot of our lives. It certainly is in mine. We spend time on Jesus. We spend time on the cross. We spend time on the Father. We spend time on creation. We don't always spend enough time on the Holy Spirit. So, I want to start with that. And that confession. That there was a temptation in me when I saw these passages to start saying... Maybe I should switch the verses for this week, or maybe I should just focus on the baptism aspect and ignore this baptism in the Holy Spirit aspect, but I'm pushing through it, and I, I want to spend some time on it, and uh, I hope you'll bear with me and uh, work through some of, the, some of the mistakes and some of the gaps I make in my logic. Here's some things we do know. Here's some things that we are confident about as confessing Christians. We know that the Holy Spirit is fully God. The Holy Spirit is co-equal with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is not less important than Jesus. We know already that the Holy Spirit is responsible for the inspiration and interpretation of scriptures. Which is good, because we Presbyterians like scriptures. So that's a good in for us. We know that the Holy Spirit 
is participating in the world now. Jesus ascended and Jesus says, it's good that I leave you because the Comforter is coming. And the Comforter will be with you. And we know about the Holy Spirit that there is this experience that's associated, this, this baptism, this receiving of the Holy Spirit. I have for a long time searched for the meaning and the significance of this experience, what it means to receive the Holy Spirit. I've asked a lot of smart people. Some of the best answers I've gotten have come from African church leaders, uh, people who've come to this country from far away, because just like I talked about last week, sometimes when we have a weakness, it helps to, to go elsewhere, go to another ethnic community or another theological community to see their strength. Uh, charismatic theologians talk about it a lot, but the problem is some of those people will tell you unjustifiable or extra-biblical things. The truth is, in a lot of the American church culture, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is associated with an outpouring of miraculous gifts. Um, if you're like me, when you think of this experience, you imagine people falling down on the stage on TV. And I don't... <clears throat> I'm not here to tell you that those things are always illegitimate, but I think at least a lot of the time they are. And I think that the experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit has to be more than that. So, as a non-expert, let me tell you what I have so far from all of my research. These two passages, Luke 3 and Acts 8, are very close to all we have on the subject. We know that there's this experience. We might be able to supplement with Ephesians chapter 5, where it simply says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And a couple of verses, um, a sort of refrain that occurs throughout the Old Testament, especially Judges, where the Spirit of the Lord came upon fill in the blank. Um, throughout Judges, you have the Spirit of the Lord came upon Othaniel. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Ehud. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. And then they go about to do these mighty things. I'm making a broad assumption that these all refer to the same basic type of experience. Coming upon, being baptized in or immersed in, uh, receiving, being filled with. Um, that they... It, Basically, some people will try to split all of those things up, and I think if you do that, you're just not left with enough scripture to deal with. If we work with them together and talk about what it means, we have a little bit more we can work with, and we can start to define a trend line. And if we do that, what we get is that it's like conversion. It's like baptism. It's like the first time you committed to follow Christ, but it takes place after that. Let me read you Acts 8 again. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Holy Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. For the Sumerians, it had been a long time. It, it, it had been, you know, several months that they'd been following Jesus, but then this experience took place afterwards. And according to a particular tensing, in the original languages, in Hebrew and Greek, it appears that the filling with the Holy Spirit can take place again and again. That there could be moments of one's life where you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and you go out, and then after a while you get filled again. These texts testify to an experience of falling in love with God again for the first time. An experience of coming upon a renewed faith and power and experience in the Christian life. The baptism of Jesus, the, the baptism that Jesus offers is a renewal. 
Have you had this sort of experience? I've had this sort of experience. Some people describe this experience taking place as a renaissance in their prayer life. For many people, they'll tell you, oh yes, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I know what that's like. I prayed for the Holy Spirit to become a deeper part of my life. And ever since then, my prayers have never been the same. Suddenly I was praying and it wasn't boring anymore. It was powerful and emotional and efficacious. And God started answering prayers in my life and the lives of the people I love. Other people have associated it with evangelism. They'll talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit like the saints at Pentecost and being filled with boldness to proclaim the word of God to people that do not know. They begin preaching to their friends and neighbors, and the Christian life becomes an adventure again. Some of us use that phrase to describe a recommitment, or a return from a dark night of the soul. St. John of the Cross coined that term, dark night of the soul. C.S. Lewis had a similar experience when he lost his wife. Sometimes there are dry times in the Christian life, places where you feel like you're walking alone, through the desert, and God isn't there. God feels far away. And sometimes the Holy Spirit enters into those times and renews the brightness. And it seems like the saturation has been turned up on life again. For me, it was my call to be a missional Christian. It was the moment when I moved from the belief that Jesus Christ had died on the cross and forgiven my sins, and that was a good thing for me to believe so that I could go to heaven, and instead believed that Jesus had died on the cross, and that was a first step in a worldview that would transform the entire world, that I could teach and help and motivate others to do likewise and to learn more and to follow Christ more and more each day in such a way that we could make the world a better place. And after I had that realization, when I look back on my faith as it was previously, it was like a whole different religion. It was like I became a whole new person. I felt like I'd crossed a threshold. And I did. And I was. And I will be again. Because I haven't arrived. Because Christianity is bigger than I think it is. God is more expansive and multifaceted than we can possibly imagine and has more to offer than we could possibly currently be taking advantage of. So there's always more to learn. There's always more to experience. Maybe you've moved into the evangelism category, but you haven't moved into the prayer category. I think I could move more into the prayer category. Maybe there's another category that I haven't even thought of yet, that the Holy Spirit is right now tugging on your heart to pull you towards, to say there's more. There's something else I want you to experience. You're ready. If that's the case, I want to do something unusual, at least for our church tradition. I want to do an altar call. I'm going to take a page out of the televangelist books. Now, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not going to make you come forward or raise your hands. But, if you're ready, and you feel like God is working on you as I talk, and you feel like this description of a renewed filling with God is something you want, I'd ask you to pray this prayer with me. And, and if not, if you are content with your life as it is, praise God. That's good. That doesn't mean you're not listening. Take this time to ignore me and thank God for his goodness to you. But if you want more, would you pray with me? Lord God, Oh my God. <laughs> uh, do we want to repeat after me? We can do that. I didn't mean to force you to it. Let's. All right, let's do it. Lord God, Lord God. Holy, Spirit, Holy Spirit, I recognize today, I recognize today that, this that this experience of you that I've called my Christian life is limited. That this experience of you that I've called my Christian life is limited. I'm ready for more. I'm ready for more. I ask you, Holy Spirit, 
I ask you, Holy Spirit, to enter my life anew today. To enter my life anew today. And fill me. And come upon me in a new way. And come upon me in a new way. Immerse me in you. Immerse me in you. I believe that there is more to prayer. I believe that there is more to prayer. More to evangelism. More to evangelism. More to mission. More to mission. More to you. More to you. Than I have previously been aware of. Than I have previously been aware of. I ask that you would show me. I ask that you would show me. Hold my feet to the fire and keep me honest. Hold my feet to the fire and keep me honest. To the commitment I am making now. To the commitment I am making now. Let this be a turning point in my life. Let this be a turning point in my life. After which I began to hear your voice. After which I began to hear your voice. As I never had before. As I never had before. I offer this time of silence, God, to listen to you. Amen. 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 Hymn number three twenty two is Spirit of the Living God. <laughs> 